This is Defending Democracy, a weekly podcast from Democracy Docket. We're your hosts. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. This is a special edition of Defending Democracy. Mark, usually we do a deep dive into a single topic. We talk about redistricting. We talk about litigation, voter suppression, election vigilantism. This time, though, we're bringing something back from the Spaces Day of Defending Democracy. And I loved take- the Spaces Days of Defending Democracy. This was before Elon Musk took over Twitter and ruined the place. We all miss when Twitter was a functional website, but we're bringing one of our favorite aspects of Twitter spaces to the Defending Democracy podcast. And this week, we have collected questions from subscribers and listeners. And Mark, you're going to answer them. I can't wait. Let's get started. Our first question is from Sam, who asks, given the new speaker, what should we be on the lookout for in the upcoming 2024 elections? When will the Democrats take majority of the House again? So great question, Sam. And there are two really important questions. So on the first one, um, this speaker is all bad. Um, This guy is, you know, if you were to rank all of the House Republicans on a scale of most pro-democracy to most insurrectionist, right, There'd be no one, to be clear, on the pro-democracy side, right? They're all anti-democracy. But there'd be a handful of people down at the end who at least mouth the words about democracy and they they voted to certify the election. Then at the other end of the spectrum, like, by the way, you're going past like Jim Jordan, right? You are like, you are at the very other end of the spectrum. You have um, Speaker Johnson who organized the brief filed by 126 members of the House of Representatives in December of 2020 to try to throw out the election results in four entire states. This would have disenfranchised more than 20 million voters. It would have altered the outcome of the election. It would have thrown democracy into chaos. And this is the guy who organized that effort. You know, I wrote a piece page for Democracy Docket about how that case, that Texas case, I think should have been included in the indictments. Whether it was charge conduct or not, you cannot understand January 6th without understanding that case. Because that that lawsuit and the organizing effort that Speaker Johnson uh, led to organize the 126 members of the House, that becomes the backbone of what becomes January 6th and the effort to to deny certification on the floor of the House. So this is a very dangerous guy. He obviously opposes voting rights. He opposes reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. He opposes free and fair elections. He is an election denier. You know, he is all of those things. But he is those things plus the organizer of that um, that brief uh, in late December. So what does that mean for 2024? It means that we're all going to have to be a lot more vigilant because the person who is two heartbeats away from the presidency of the United States uh, is is that guy. And he, as the Speaker of the House, has a lot of power, both rhetorical power, how he directs the Republican um, House uh, uh, conference and its political arms, how they spend money, how they litigate, uh, what issues they emphasize. He is the leader of that. He is the highest ranking, think about this page, he is the highest ranking Republican in government. In government, the highest ranking Republican. So very, very dangerous for 2024. And we're going to have to be uh, in a world in which we're already worried about election subversion and, and election of vigilantism. We're, have to, we're going to have to be even more concerned. Now, when will Democrats take the majority of the House again? In my opinion, they'll take the majority of the House in 2024. You know, if you look at uh, what Republican dysfunction has meant for this country, you you look at how extreme they are. You know, everyone who keeps telling me about these moderates, there are no moderates in the House. There are 18 Republicans who sit in districts where they need to pretend to be moderates. They all voted for this guy to be speaker. Every one of them. They voted for this guy to be speaker. So I think that's not going to sit well with the American public. I think uh, we've had some successes in redistricting litigation that will hopefully uh, create more opportunities. Uh, but I am looking forward to speaker 
um, Johnson being a one-term speaker um, and Speaker Jeffries uh, taking the gavel uh, after the 2024 elections. Mike asks, what's happening with the law licenses of the three attorneys who pleaded guilty in the Fulton County election subversion case? Will they be able to retain the licenses or will they face further disciplinary action? So it's a very important question. I, I wrote a piece for Democracy Docket uh, literally a, a few days after the January 6th uh, insurrection and talked about um, the, that there needs to be an, an examination of the role that lawyers played. I wrote a piece more recently on just that topic about how something is, is horribly wrong within uh, the Republican legal establishment. Um, Paige, I hope you can include that in the in the in the show notes. Paige, I hope maybe you can link that in the show notes. Um, but the but my basic premise was, and this is before the guilty pleas. Uh, you know, you had in the federal indictment in Washington D.C. five unindicted co-conspirators who were Republican lawyers, and they're Republican lawyers from all walks of life. Some of them are political. Some of them were government lawyers. Some of them were practicing, some of them were less practicing. One was a former mayor of New York City, you know, and and so something ter gone terribly wrong in the culture and the um, uh, and the approach Republican lawyers have played in our democracy. And now we have seen three of those three lawyers plead guilty, and there are other lawyers under indictment. And you know what's going to happen to them? I think is going to speak a lot about the future role of lawyers and the bar in this country. If the, if, the, if the various bar associations are unable to take disciplinary action um, and, uh, and show the American people that uh, be having a law license, which is a privilege, by the way, Paige, it's not a right, you have a privilege to have a law license, um, uh, that with that comes responsibilities, not just to your clients, but to, and not just to the courts, but to the, the constitution and democracy. If, if the bar associations are unable to do that, then I think it will, it will, um, uh, it will be a dramatic step, uh, uh, for, uh, undermining the legitimacy, frankly, of the bars, the bar, you know, the various state bars, these are all decided on a state by state basis. Each state has its own bar. And just like we're watching a crisis in legitimacy of the courts right now, in many respects, uh, due to the actions of judges and justices, um, I think it will it will further erode the confidence that the American people have in the role lawyers play in the justice system. And so, what's going to happen? Well, you know, we've already seen um, you know we'd already seen Jenna Ellis face disciplinary action before this. Uh, we saw the uh, Mayor Giuliani face. Uh, 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 action. Eastman, uh, John Eastman is uh, in the middle of bar uh, disbarment proceedings. So, you know, I expect that these three attorneys specifically who have pled guilty, they're going to face, you know, the bars are going to take notice of that and the bars will investigate. And I think it's really important that those bar associations take action, frankly, regardless of the guilty pleas. You know, I think the bar associations need to hold all of these attorneys to higher standards. So hopefully the guilty pleas will, will uh, accelerate that. But I think it's really, really important. From David, is there a path to getting Trump removed from the ballot nationwide based on the 14th Amendment, or will it be a state by state case? Will it go up to the U.S. Supreme Court? So, David, it's a little bit of both, right? It's a it, the Fourteenth Amendment obviously applies in all fifty states. So, it is in that sense, it is a nationwide question, right? If he is not qualified under the Fourteenth Amendment um, to be president because of his aid and comfort to an insurrection, for those of you who don't know what what we're talking about, the Fourteenth Amendment has several provisions. One of them talks about being disqualified from holding office if you were an officer of the United States and you um, were involved in uh, rebellion or giving aid and comfort uh, uh, essentially to it. Uh, and there are lots of legal scholars who have made compelling arguments that Donald Trump is no longer eligible to be president under that provision. That is being um, 
uh, litigated in states. So it is state by state in the sense that um, the challenges to his eligibility will be done on a state by state basis. Someone will bring a challenge and say, and people have saying, I don't believe he's eligible to be on the ballot in say Colorado. Okay. If Colorado will decide only for Colorado, but, but the same standard is applied in all 50 states. So presumably what's going to happen is one of these cases will wind up going up the federal courts to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will rule on it, and then that will then bind all 50 states. So it'll be tested on a state-by-state basis. It'll be litigated on a state-by-state basis, but the results will, uh, will have nationwide application. Donna asks, what criteria do you use to determine when to enter into litigation? Boy, Donna, that is a big question, um, and it's a really important one. Um, I take very seriously the obligation that I have and my legal team has uh, to bring litigation where it can make a positive difference in the lives of voters. Uh, and not to bring litigation where, where it can't. And, and, and so it's not just deciding where to enter. It's also deciding when not to. So let me try to, let me try to lay that out. Um, what the criteria we use in determining where to litigate are, first of all, uh, you know, what, what are the laws, rules, or practices that are affecting the ability of a significant number of voters to be able to participate in the electoral process. Um, there are lots of unfair voting rules, but they don't really affect anyone or many people. And so we tend to not focus on those. Um, we try to look at the practices or procedures that are having, or laws that are having a significant impact. The second is we particularly try to focus on litigation that uh, is impacting uh, young voters, uh, and minority voters. Now, why is that? Because our system of voting in this country is rigged largely against those voting populations. If you look at who is able to vote easily, who is able to not wait in long lines, who is who is subject to higher uh, uh, or lower rates of rejections, what you find is that we have a system that by and large benefits older voters versus younger voters, white voters versus minority voters, you know, and really hits certain populations hardest. So we look at, so we look at that. And then obviously we look at the law, you know, right? We look at the law and we say, is there a legal claim? And so that brings me to the places we don't litigate. We don't litigate where there is no good argument to win, right? So we don't litigate just for the sake of sending a message or just for the sake of, 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 you know, issuing a press release. You know, we litigate because we want to achieve meaningful results for voters and for our clients. And our clients are usually organizations of the, who are looking out for the rights of voters. And so when a client comes to us and says, can you challenge this law? Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that it's impact, that the litigation would be impactful, but we want to know that also that it has a reasonable prospect of success. It doesn't mean we win every case, but we win more than we lose. We win more than people think we, we, we will, uh, there, you know, I'm always pleasant, pleasantly surprised when I get it, when I read in the newspaper, uh, some reporter saying that in a surprise ruling, uh, X, Y, Z happened. And I'm always like, well, it wasn't a surprise to me. It may have been a surprise to you, but I like to, you know, but we want to make sure that we have good claims, uh, to bring. And the heartbreaking ones are where a lot of voters are being negatively impacted, but where the law just doesn't provide an avenue for relief. And those are the hardest cases that we analyze, um, because we look and we look and we look, but ultimately if there's not a lawsuit there, we don't bring it. And Paige, we've talked about some of those over, over time where, I, where I'm heartbroken that there isn't something that I feel like me and my legal team can do. Uh, and I'm always encouraging that if there are other lawyers who have a legal theory and have a claim, I will cheer them on. You know, And sometimes, by the way, they do and they win. And I'm thrilled that they saw something that we didn't see. We talked a little bit, Paige, uh, with one of our earlier guests about uh, the, um, the Eighth Amendment claim um, in, um, uh, I think it was in Mississippi, right? Yeah. And like, that's a claim I never, like, I never thought to bring. Um, but I thought that the work that, uh, that folks did to bring that claim to get reenfranchisement. I know that that case, by the way, is still in the appellate court. So it's, there's still some, um, back and forth around it, but, uh, 
you know, sometimes we do, we miss something and I love when other people uh, uh, have success. Sal asks, why isn't voting considered speech and thus protected by the First Amendment? If money is speech, why isn't voting? Sal, that is a great question. It is, uh, it is uh, you are a man after my own heart. If you are a lawyer, congratulations. If you are not, you should consider becoming one. Uh, because when we talk about what is protected by the Constitution, uh, it's not just idle chatter. One of the things about something being protected by the Constitution is that it creates more uh, barriers to states infringing on those rights. So uh, for one of the reasons why so many people are disappointed with the with the way in which campaign finance in this country is regulated or not regulated, is that the Supreme Court has determined that the spending of money in elections is expressive speech, and therefore it is covered by the First Amendment. And because it's covered by the First Amendment, that means that Congress and the states are able to put relatively fewer restrictions on money in politics, because it, to do so would be a restriction on the First Amendment right to free speech. So that is why that is such an important thing that the court's done with money in politics. And when you look at voting, rather than affording it that same level of, of very heightened protection, where restrictions on voting would be presumptively invalid, as restrictions on money in politics are. If, you want to, if you're a state that wants to restrict money in politics, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to do it at all. And then oftentimes it gets struck down. When it comes to voting, um, voting laws are judged on essentially a balancing test, a, a sliding scale test of how important is the, the, this restriction on voting to the state and how burdensome is it on the voter? We don't, we don't ask that when we talk about people who want to stand on the corner and speak about politics. We don't really ask that question when we talk about money in politics because they are considered fundamental rights under the First Amendment. And I think that the, the courts have gone horribly awry, I mean horribly awry, in this area. I've written about this for a democracy docket, and we'll, we'll include a link to that in the show notes, um, that I think that one of the most important things that, that state legislators could do in their state constitutions is to affirm that voting is a fundamental right and subject to this heightened protection. And I think that Democrats and progressives at the national level need to make this a core principle of the advancement of American jurisprudence that um, the right to vote is not something to be weighed and balanced and traded off against other state interests, but rather should be the paramount interest and restrictions on the right to vote should be struck down. Audrey asks, how is it legal for a person to campaign for one political party, win the election, and then switch parties after they take office? This seems like clear fraud against voters to me. <laughs> Audrey, there are a lot of people who agree with you. There are a lot of people who think it's a fraud against the voters. And there are lots of people who think when they, speaking of campaign contributions, think it's a fraud against the donors. I mean, imagine imagine you wrote a $25 check or you clicked on a link and you gave money to someone and then it turns out they flipped from being a Democrat to a Republican. Um, you're pretty angry. You feel like, you know, the money you gave was, you know, kind of, you know, uh, taken under false pretenses. So there's a lot of understandable anger about this. And, you know, the situation that we saw in North Carolina, for example, where Democrats uh, held uh, held a, a one seat ability to block Republicans from overturning the governor's veto. The governor of North Carolina is a Democrat and, and Republicans were one vote shy of being able to overturn the governor's veto. And a Democrat in a solidly blue district I mean, this wasn't even a swing district in a solidly blue district uh, who campaigned as a Democrat, campaigned on Democratic issues, raised Demo money as a Democrat, then flipped to become a Republican. And, and the real world consequences for the citizens of North Carolina are disastrous as a result. Republicans now can enact legislation over the Democratic governor's veto that will significantly degrade the life um, and dignity of people living in that state. So this is, and that's just one example. This happens, you know, uh, in, in in many, many places with party switchers. The problem is that um, as much as you may feel like it is a fraud on you, and I, I'm not invalidating your feelings, I totally understand it and I sympathize with them. The problem is people are elected 
um, for a fixed term of office and who they decide to caucus with internally, who they decide to, you know, sort of hang out with and take their legislative cues from um, is really not something that is binding. And so, you know, it certainly can have consequences when they run for re-election. The party can choose to not allow them to be nominated in some states, or they can they can do things to try to make it clear that they are no longer an endorsed candidate. But in terms of how they vote in the legislative chambers, um, we're kind of at the mercy of those people uh, acting uh, acting uh, honorably. So that is uh, that's the unfortunate reality of that. Mike, on our podcast, we normally talk about what keeps you up at night, what you're worried about, threats facing our democracy. But for once, let's give you the opportunity to give some happy news. What gives you hope for a democracy in the 2024 election? Yeah. So you mentioned at the beginning that we used to do a weekly spaces, which is like an audio platform that was on Twitter. And one of the reasons why we did it was because I got to hear from Sam and Mike and David, and Donna, and Lisa, and Sal, and Audrey, and hundreds of other people like them every week where they could ask me questions, but they could also tell me what they are doing. There was a woman, you may remember, who I think she lived in Georgia, and yet she commuted every week to North Carolina to do get out the vote. She, she, she drove she, out of her own pocket, she would go there because the North Carolina elections and the redistricting challenges and all that were going on. And she wanted to be a part of that. And so what gives me hope going into 2024 is not something that a judge can do. It's not something that a politician can do. It's nothing Joe Biden can do. It is something that all of you do, which is that every single day you go out into the world and you tell your friends, your coworkers, your clients, your customers, that fighting for democracy is essential. And it's not okay to sit on the sidelines. It's not okay to say, you know what, this isn't my problem. It's not okay to say this isn't my fight. Every single one of you gives me hope. When you take to Twitter, you take to Facebook, you go on Reddit, you go on threads, you know, on Instagram, on TikTok, and you speak out about the importance of protecting free and fair elections, that you vote for candidates who are going to protect democracy, that you take to the streets when the U.S. Supreme Court takes away fundamental rights from women, right? It's all of those, it's all of those actions, more than any one court case, that is going to allow us to get through this. Because we can sue and we can ensure that in 2024, there are better rules for voting. We can sue and we can make sure that election deniers don't gum up the works and prevent elections from being certified. And I, I read all of the comments and, and, and emails that we get from people thanking for the work that I and my law firm do and all of the great work that Democracy Docket does in amplifying these messages and putting out news about this. And that's all really, really important. And so thank you for, for all of the kind words. But at the end of the day, the courts are not going to save us from tyranny. The courts are not going to save us from um, authoritarianism. What's going to save us is when enough everyday Americans turn to their neighbor, turn to their uncle and say, what you're saying is wrong. When you are targeting minority voters because you don't want them to participate in democracy, that is wrong. When you are making it harder for young voters to vote simply because you don't like who they vote for, that is wrong and it's not okay. And so all of you who do that every day are the real heroes of democracy. And it is what gives me hope because if the moment you all stop doing that, I can hang up my, my, my efforts in court. You know, I, I started democracy docket to be the leading news and information platform around democracy. Because I needed, I wanted to be able to arm all of you with accurate information. I wanted you to be able to see the court cases. I wanted you to get first quarterly, then weekly, uh, then monthly, then weekly, and now daily news updates about what's going on. Not just so that you're informed about it, 
because you are going to speak up. You're going to stand up. You're going to tell that person who says that, you know, X, Y, Z is going on in this state. You're going to say, no, no, no. I have accurate information about that. I know what's going on in that court case. I know what's going on in that redistricting. And, and so that's why democracy docket plays such a fundamental role. But again, it's all supporting the thing that really gives me hope, which is all of you. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. You can find all of the cases and articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. And to find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and make sure you are subscribed to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabby Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.